Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, give it a, a minute for people to, to roll in. I think there's still people coming in. Well, great, it looks like it slowed down a little bit. Why don't we get started? Uh, good morning again. Uh, welcome to today's Future Supply Actions Funding Program webinar. My name is Warren Tights. I'm a team manager within Metropolitan's Water Resource Management Group, and I'm also the program manager for the Future Supply Action Funding Program. We call it our FSA program. Today's webinar focuses on the San Diego County Water Authority's demonstration study of wedge wire screens for the Carlsbad desalination plant. And we're going to get started shortly, but first, uh, a few housekeeping items. And next slide, please, Tim. There we go. So we are recording today's webinar, and uh, so your microphones will be muted. Uh, we will be posting the recording and the slides to our website at the uh, after this is all completed, and we'll post a link to that website uh, at, at the very end. Uh, we plan to have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so not, not during at the end. So please type your questions in the Q&A and we will get to them uh, time permitting. So next slide, please. Uh, so first I wanna give you a quick introduction to Metropolitan and the FSA program. Metropolitan is the uh, largest wholesale water provider in the nation. We're the primary wholesaler in Southern California. Our water supplies support 19 million people, a $1 trillion economy, and uh, a 5,200 square mile service area. We sell our water to 26 member agencies. Mem many of them are retail agencies, but some of them are also wholesale agencies. Uh, we support, we import water from the Colorado River through our Colorado River Aqueduct. And you can see that coming in uh, from the right. And also from Northern California through our state water, through the state water uh, project. And you can see that the two aqueducts coming in from the north. As you all know, mo both of those supplies are in crisis mode right now. All right, next slide, please. So uh, we're more than just a water uh, importer. O over the past 30 years, we've worked very hard to diversify our water supply portfolio with storage, with transfers, with exchange exchanges, but also conservation and local supplies. And we've, we've invested well more than one and a half billion dollars uh, in alternative supplies. And our member agencies like the San Diego County Water Authority have invested uh, many billions more. And innovation is key uh, to our success as a region as we pursue uh, a one water supply approach uh, towards reliability. You know, the current extreme drought that we're experiencing uh, in the Colorado River in Northern California underscored the need for bold actions uh, and, and especially with local supplies. And this is where our FSA program fits in. Uh, next slide, please. We established the Future Supply Action Funding Program in, with our 2010 Integrated Resources Plan and with the goal of driving innovation in local resource development. And if I could summarize the program in, in a sentence, it's really to remove barriers to local supply production, technological barriers, regula 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 regulatory barriers, and institutional barriers. Uh, this is how we de-risk technologies. We need to pilot them, demonstrate new technologies and approaches so that we can deploy them. Uh, one of the hallmarks of this program is that even though each study benefits a particular member agency or a particular project, the findings and the lessons learned and the results uh, benefit other member agencies in the region and, and throughout California. So the FSA program encompasses four uh, resources, local resources, groundwater, stormwater, uh, potable reuse and recycling, and also brackish groundwater and seawater desalination. And uh, we've been fortunate to be able to fund studies in all four of those research resource categories. Next slide, please. So the current program, which uh, we're in the process of wrapping up, uh, included 14 studies we co-funded with our member agencies, uh, member agency partners, and that included 3.1 million in metropolitan co-funding. That leveraged about $7 million in member agency and local agency funding. Uh, most of those studies are, are either complete or on the way to being complete. Uh, we also, during this round, funded just under a million dollars with the Water Research Foundation 
Uh, and that, that funding went to six potable reuse studies, including two uh, that were essential for establishing DPR regulations in California, and one agricultural reuse study, which I, I think could be super helpful you know, as this mega drought continues uh, in the West. Uh, but before I go on to the next slide, I just wanna say, uh, there was a recent PPI study that, that came out that showed that uh, oh, almost 80% of likely voters in California supported seawater desalination as a, as a supply. Interestingly enough, that same uh, poll showed that si the, same, the same group, 60% of them or more than that, uh, supported strong ocean protection and protecting coastal resources, protecting the beach. So therein lies the rub, and this is exactly what uh, the, the the topic of today's study is. It's uh, coming is evaluating environmentally protective intakes for seawater desalination. Next slide, please. So uh, at this point, I, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Nathan Faber from the San Diego County Water Authority, our, our partner for this study, and uh, let him introduce the study and the main speaker. Uh, Nathan, the floor is yours, take it away. Thanks a lot, Warren. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Faber. I'm a principal engineer at the San Diego County Water Authority, and I wanna just provide some brief background on the project. So uh, as Warren said, uh, to diversify our water supplies in the San Diego region, the Water Authority partnered with Poseidon uh, to construct the largest desalination plant in the Western Hemisphere here in Carlsbad. And the, and the Claude Bud Lewis Carlsbad desalination plant was operational in December of 2015 and has since produced al almost uh, 300,000 acre feet of high quality drinking water. Uh, and as Tim will get into, uh, the plant was co-located with the Encina Power Station and utilize the plant's existing infrastructure to bring seawater from the Agua Hedionda Lagoon. And the power station was recently decommissioned. If you've ever been driven past Carlsbad recently, you've noticed that the smokestack is no longer there and is in the process of being demolished. And this requires Poseidon to modify the intake. So in order for the plant to stay online, uh, construction of the new intake was con conducted in phases. So three phases. The first phase was complete in June of 2020 and included the installation of new dilution pumps to replace the power facility's cooling water pump system. And the last phase is installing new intake screens. And the screens need to comply with the Ocean Plan Amendment uh, adopted by the state of California in 2015. And the focus of this presentation is a pilot study conducted by the Water Authority and Poseidon to test new intake screen technologies. And we wanted to thank MWD uh, for developing this funding program and supporting us on the project. We also wanted to acknowledge the hard work and excellent support we got on this project from Warren Tights and his staff, uh, Hannah Ake, who's no longer at Metropolitan, and Don Bentley, who's uh, picked up the project and really helped us out. In addition, we also wanna thank uh, the Division of Water Resources, State of California, DWR, uh, also, they, they provided funding for this project. So really appreciate all the support. And with that, I will turn it over now to Tim Hogan, who led the pilot project, and he will go over the details of the project. Great. Thanks a lot, Nathan. And thank you also to Warren. Uh, so just quickly, my name is Tim Hogan. I'm the principal and owner of a small consulting firm called TWB Environmental Research and Consulting. I'm a fish biologist that's worked with engineers for about 20 years now, specifically on protection of marine life at industrial water intakes. So here's the agenda for the presentation today. I recognize we probably have a lot of folks on the phone and I'm gonna do my best to, to stick to this so that we've got some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll go over a bit more about the background. I think Nathan gave us a great sort of overview of the plant specifics. Um, we'll discuss the objectives of this pilot or demonstration scale study. I'll go through a bit of the project design, mostly in picture format, because again, I don't want to get lost in the weeds and pictures, I think, tell the best story. We'll go through how the pilot was operated, uh, some of the results and conclusions or lessons learned through this project. 
And then I'll touch on a couple of related studies that sort of um, followed on after the pilot project began with Wedgewire. So here we'll cover some of the background and objectives. Um, as you heard from Nathan, what instigated the research into new intake technologies was when the NRG power station went offline and the pumps were shut down. So the co-located desalination plant would need to start drawing its own flow for feed water rather than drawing flow through the power plant. As you heard Nathan say, this was a modification to the existing intake and discharge structure that was completed in phases. I'm just showing you here phase three, which is um, where I wanna walk you through how water flows through the facility. So I'll try to put a picture to the words that Nathan just provided. So what we're talking about is an array of 16 large wedge wire screens with one millimeter slot size designed for a half foot per second or less through the slots would need to be installed out in the lagoon. They would have lateral pipe connections, which you see here, these four pipe connections to the existing intake structure. We would remove all of the connections to flow that had been passing through the power plant and flow would be routed in this manner. From the intake screens through the laterals to the existing pump station, no changes to that intake pump station. Feed water is delivered to the desal plant. Brine is returned and mixed with the additional flow coming from a new fish friendly pump station that's been installed. And that diluted brine would make it offshore through the existing um, discharge pond. So there are two different wedge wire technologies that were evaluated at a very high screening level. Um, if we were to build this intake at full scale, the first we refer to as a passive wedge wire screen. And you can see in the bottom left what they look like. They're typically T-shaped screens. Again, we'd need an array of 16 large screens four on each of the four laterals, and they're completely passive in that nothing is moving on those screens, but they do have an automatic air backwash system providing compressed air to the screen to backwash off any impinged debris. The second wedge wire screen intake design we're referring to as an active wedge wire screen. Folks may recognize these um, also as rotating brush clean screens. The only real difference here is based on the installation that would be required, we were looking at vertical drums rather than horizontal T-shaped screens. And these are screens whose drums will rotate against a fixed external brush and an internal brush that rotates on an axis. So the mesh material itself would be cleaned by the rotation of the screen drum. So the objectives of the study were really to evaluate the performance of each of these two types of wedge wire screens at this very specific site in Aguajedionda Lagoon. We're looking at their performance in terms of biofouling prevention on the screening surface so that we're confident flow can be drawn through them. We wanted to look at how well they manage free floating debris rather than that attached biofouling and how they could release it from the screen if it were to impinge. And then we also wanted to make some assessments about what the operation and maintenance needs may be if we scaled up what we see at a pilot scale to a full scale system. So how did we go about it? Well, what's different about this study and folks on the, on the, on the call may recognize that there've been a number of wedge wire pilot scale studies over the years. Uh, many in California, but most of those have been coupon or screen section studies. Whereas this study, we use actual screens at a pilot scale, but we're drawing flow actively through them, which is a, a critical component to understand um, the nature of fouling. With flow passing through a screen, fouling is likely to be higher. So we did an active pumping test over a 12-month duration, uh, we tested those screens at the proposed intake location for a full scale, scale installation. So we didn't have to translate any of the information to a new location. 
And the study was conducted for a one year duration to give us sort of a long term perspective. So here's a bit about the project design. Um, this is a, just an overview slide to walk you through. Here's the lagoon. There was an offshore component we're referring to as the pilot skid. There's an umbilical connecting it to shore, a roughly 900 foot umbilical. And onshore, we had a container that we referred to as the portable control room, which housed the screen controls for the active screen, which rotated the air compressor and receiver for the passive screen air burst system, and then all the electrical panel and data logging and transmission system. You can see in the inset, um, here's what it looked like after the equipment has been installed and it's completely submerged, be it warning buoys and a boom uh, to keep recreational boaters out of the area. So here's a picture of um, some of the, the two screens that we're testing as well as the skid as a whole. Top left, you see this rotating brush clean screen. What's visible in this picture is the fixed external brush against which this screen drum rotates. Here is the passive T-shaped screen. Uh, both screens were one millimeter slot size designed for less than half foot per second to mimic what we would have to design at a full scale. Here's the overall skid, which includes the screens, a submersible pump, and a discharge tube for each side. So this was a side-by-side -side test. The skid was designed such that one screen wouldn't be affecting the other hydraulically, and flow is essentially drawn through the screen through the pump box and then discharged through the through that um, discharge piping there. So no flow was being drawn to, to shore so that we could avoid the maintenance of having a pipeline 900 feet potentially being fouled. Bottom right picture, you see a custom fabricated barge um, that was used to install the skid. Here we are offshore about 900 feet from the uh, power plant that once existed. The umbilical uh, was paid out from a large spool, again, roughly 900 feet. The umbilical contained the air com the compressed air line to deliver air to the passive air burst screen, uh, two power cables for each of the two submersible pumps, as well as communication cabling for data collection purposes. That umbilical was connected onshore to what we referred to as the portable control room really a container filled with all the equipment. You can see where that umbilical once sunk and anchored is coming to shore and penetrated the portable control room. The compressor and air receiver for the air burst system. And then all the other uh, requisite equipment. We have flow meters here in the center so we can monitor flow through each of those discharge tubes offshore. And then we had real-time monitoring of turbidity as well. And here's the control panel with a human machine interface that was accessible to me remotely from where I live just outside of Boston. So a bit about the operation of the screens, you know, and of the skid in general. The pumps, the submersible pumps for each of the screens were run continuously except for routine scheduled inspections and maintenance. Um, the screen cleaning, which is uh, either the rotation of the active screen or the air bursting of the passive screen was varied based on observations from month to month to try to hone in on what would be sort of best practice for full scale installation. We did have monthly dive surveys um, to conduct observation underwater and complete any maintenance tasks. There was also weekly inspection of the onshore components in the portable control room. And the data that were monitored in real time and transmitted to me via this interface uh, included flow rate from each of the pumps, pressure differential through each of the screening systems, pump amperage, which can be used as a corollary for uh, the effort the pump has to exert in order to draw flow through a screen, and then turbidity through each discharge tube where we were trying to log whether or not a cleaning event had an effect on turbidity downstream. 
There were also data that were logged rather than real time. And those included um, ambient currents through the use of an acoustic Doppler current profiler and then typical water quality surveys um, for a 401 permit. Each of those two components are things we might plug into a forecasting tool down the road if we wanted to understand which conditions either hydrodynamically or from a water quality sense may impact um, fouling of a screen surface. So this is probably the easiest way to picture what's going on. Here's what the screens look like submerged. We had a real-time cabled camera um, available for us through the first quarter or so of the study to capture video. So in the top left here, I'll show a short clip about 10 seconds of the active screen. So you can see what it looks like. You can see the drum rotating. The drum would rotate a minute in one direction, stop, and then rotate a minute in the opposite direction. And you can see the screen's in pretty good shape there, pretty representative of what we saw through the study. And then on the bottom right here, we see the passage screen, which has a soft a layer of soft fouling over it. And here's what the airburst looks like. It's quite vigorous um, in an attempt to dislodge anything that might be impinged on the screen. Again, about a 10 second clip to give you a feel. Apologies, it's a little bit frozen here. Oh dear. Stand by. Apologies for the technical difficulty, folks. Seems to be videos always do that. And can Warren or Nathan just unmute and tell me if you can see what you need to see? That, that's perfect, Tim. Uh, okay. Good recovery. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. It wouldn't be a virtual meeting if someone didn't make a mistake. Let's see if we can get it through to the next slide, though. Apologies, we may have to try this again, folks. Tim, I, I also have the, the presentation keyed up if, if this doesn't work. Okay, yeah, give me one more shot. So I can just skip over that slide. Hmm. All right, keep my fingers crossed. So you, you saw what the screens do. Um, and now here's sort of a matrix of how we operated for that 12 month period. It's essentially broken down into various phases here across the columns. I think what's important to point out is for the passive screen, we were sort of tweaking the number of air bursts per day, as well as the means for triggering an air burst event based on what we were seeing. You see we're here at one, four air bursts per day. We're trying to use signals from the screen itself, back to four air bursts per day, and then finally um, eight air bursts per day. On the active side, we remained pretty steady. It was three rotations per day throughout um, essentially the whole 12 month period. I will point out here between June 18th and August 12th, we had a typical field project event where the skid became partially unanchored and we had to, for safety reasons, just lock out, tag out all the equipment. So for that reason, we don't have data during that period. So a bit about the results, I'll start at a very general level here. Um, 
the equipment maintenance was the real challenge in the lagoon. And I think this is a very simple but important lesson to learn. Working offshore in any marine environment, whether it's open ocean or lagoon, means that if something goes wrong, you need to scramble some divers to get in there and fix stuff. And so what you see in some of these, some of these issue, uh, figures down here, this was a hole that developed a pretty large hole, about an inch in diameter in one of the um, flow meters. We had to scramble and put together some makeshift um, large cathodic protection because what was supplied wasn't quite adequate. And here you can see the divers sort of uh, responding to get equipment in the water so that we're protecting, protecting everything from corrosion. And then I have a few slides here on each of the, the wedge wire screens. Again, I'm trying to keep this high level, just given the interest of time. What I'll point out again is both screens, the passive and active, were fabricated of super duplex stainless steel, where in a marine environment, um, what's typical globally is to use a copper nickel. Um, in California, that's, it's been frowned upon, so we were not allowed to look at copper nickel. So we knew that there would be some challenges using super duplex for either one of these screens. You know, fouling would be expected. So what we saw on the passive screen is that the exterior surface did foul generally within one month. Um, and we have that information based on divers being in the water each month. Uh, again, the screen wasn't copper nickel, so I don't think that's a huge shock to me. The exterior fouling was pretty much all soft growth, and it was pretty easy to remove by divers manually just with a gloved hand and with a uh, wire brush. And though the airburst was effective for releasing any loose impinged debris, it was not effective for removing any attached biofouling, whether it was soft or hard growth. After about six months, we opened that screen up through a small hatch in each end cap to inspect the internals and learn that there was quite a bit of fouling that had accumulated on the intern flow distribution um, manifold of the screen. So we learned after that six month period during each monthly visit, we'll also have to add the task of divers manually cleaning the internal surface um, in addition to the external surface. And that was accomplished uh, by divers with a pressure washer. So not a, not a small task to open that up and get, get cleaning equipment in there. And when we scale it up to a large, um, a larger intake, that would become an O&M concern. So here's what that fouling looked like after that six months period. You know, admittedly, we probably should have opened that screen up a little sooner. Um, and there were some vagaries about how the screen was being operated. Um, whether the frequency of air bursting was sufficient. But suffice it to say, uh, what we learned here and what you can see from these pictures is it would definitely be required at a full scale to have a pretty intense O&M plan with divers cleaning the internal surfaces of screens if super duplex was required for a passive wedge wire screen. So after that event, you know, we had divers in there, we pulled the screens, cleaned everything off, and you can see when we reinstalled them, Everything was clean internal and external. And for the remaining six months of the study, um, we were able to maintain good, good clean screens with that manual monthly diver assistance. On the active screen side, again, we're talking about super duplex stainless steel screens. Uh, we see in, in these figures here that the exterior fouling was pretty well controlled by the brushes and the rotation of the screen. Um, over the full course of the study, there was really no noticeable accumulation of fouling on the external surface. I think in that top figure, you could see just some slight discoloration of loose soft bile fouling, uh, which was easily removed. Um, and that indicated to us that this, the brush bristles may not have been in direct contact, so just an indication that at a full scale for an O&M, uh, from an O&M perspective, that's something we'd want to keep an eye on, um, but otherwise the screen was in good working order for the duration of the study. Internally, you know, we had an opportunity to look at the screen at that same six month mark, um, didn't notice any occlusion anywhere that would be of concern. Uh, so we feel like, you know, the screening surface is pretty well cleaned internally and externally by that rotating brush screen, brush clean mechanism. 
Here's just a few more pictures of, of you know, on the left, a uh, good clean, clean surface here. In the center, you know, some slight discoloration where we might need to make an adjustment to that external brush to maintain contact. And then lastly, there's the interface here between the brush and the screen mesh itself, where there was some loose debris that accumulated, but the screen rotation in both directions essentially took care of that. So there were really no major occluded areas of that screen surface for passing flow. So let's just cover some lessons learned and then I'll move on to a couple of other um, interesting related projects that sprung out of this demonstration. You know, we, we knew going in that control of biofouling was gonna be our number one concern, um, especially given the fact that we'd have to use super duplex stainless steel rather than a material that may be a little more um, conducive to preventing biofouling. So we did confirm that that is an issue in the lagoon. Um, you could also see from the previous slide that maintaining equipment um, in that offshore environment is a real challenge. And that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, we did determine that the brush cleaned active wedge wire screen was better equipped to control biofouling in the lagoon under those operating conditions representative of what we would design for a full scale installation. Um, and that the active screen based on those results would likely require less maintenance at full scale, you know, essentially fewer divers in the water as frequently. The air bursted passive wedge wire screen um, did require divers for manual cleaning. And that's something that we'd have to take into account for full scale from a cost per perspective. And now a bit about two, two related studies um, that sprung out of what we had been doing. Uh, the first was a plankton sampling study. And while we had that skid in, um, in the lagoon, we wanted to address whether or not there was a biological benefit to um, using a wedge wire screen at one millimeter for preventing entrainment of organisms. And you can see the objective here is to address um, what we find in the regulation, which is that um, operators that use one millimeter screens for seawater desalination are offered a 1% credit in terms of reduction of entrainable sized organisms. And we think that that credit should probably be higher. This was a relatively small scale um, study with just three sampling events. So the data were not rigorous enough for us to make any statistical conclusions. Um, but what you see is in these two circles here, we were sampling from each of those two ports from the passive and active screen discharges. And then we were also collecting samples, as you see in the top right here, through the use of a pump from a separate unscreened intake at the same depth to get a feel for what the ambient densities are relative to the densities passing through either one of the screens. Um, we used a 335 micron net um, per the ocean plan amendment regulations for the other entrainment type studies. And our target samples were about 50 cubic meters. So the pictures here just show you, this was a, a diver assisted study where we had to hose clamp plankton nets over the discharge pumps, the nets were sized such that there would be as little extrusion as possible based on the velocities coming out of that discharge port. Organisms were collected in the cod end, taken to the surface, rinsed down and brought to the lab for identification and sorting. So again, the results were, were pretty sparse um, for, for a number of reasons, not least of which was uh, when the screens were locked out due to the anchoring issue and you know, COVID related restrictions, we were able to get out and sample, but not during the peak, um, peak periods of ichthyoplankton abundance. So we weren't able to collect a whole lot of organisms to make a statistical analysis. Um, what you can see in the picture to the right are a number of uh, essentially uh, shrimp that are associated with biofouling within the pump structure. So these were not organisms that passed through the screen and they really dominated the samples. 
But in terms of results, you know, we got roughly 13 organisms through the ambient port, the unscreened port versus six through either of those two um, active or passive screens. Again, just from a qualitative perspective, you know, there's roughly twice as many through the ambient port in order to make a, a more statistically rigorous conclusion, additional sampling would be required. But at least we, we got to start while equipment was in the water here. And then a second study um, that occurred to us while we were in process with this project was whether coatings on the super duplex stainless steel material would provide any benefit um, to reducing biofouling on, on the structure. So we looked at a um, coating coupons of super duplex stainless steel with two non-toxic foul release coatings that we think would be approved for use in California. Um, we ruled out any anti-foul copper-based um, coatings, which we know would be frowned upon from a regulatory perspective. Uh, you could see that we coated coupons um, in duplicate and they were mounted to a PVC frame. The PVC frame was lowered, as you can see in that top left picture at the existing intake lo location, um, just upstream of the bar racks. And the velocity there was roughly between 0.2 and 0.5 feet per second. And that's worth pointing out because these coatings uh, rely on hydrodynamics for sloughing of any attached organisms. They're really not designed to completely preclude settlement of biofouling organisms, but they are uh, designed to really, uh, excuse me, reduce the adhesion strength. So a flow velocity should be able to remove organisms um, fouled on those, on those coupons. That frame was lowered um, down to natural bottom and rested on the natural bottom. And the study is currently underway. We're about halfway, a little more than halfway through at this point. Um, and we're making uh, observations every two weeks to capture images um, and then process them through image analysis software to understand percent biofouling. So rather than show you a long table or a graph, I thought pictures would be worth a thousand words. Um, so here we are, we're gonna cycle through three slides. Um, the first shows you what the um, uncoated control coupons look like for a six month period. The next will show you sort of the intermediate uh, of the, well, of the two coatings, the one that performed not quite as well. And then the last will show us of the coating that performed the best. So you can see we got in the water around December of 2021, and this is taken through May, you know, month by month progression here, you can see things are getting quite a bit worse without a coating on that super duplex stainless. Um, you know, there's a combination of small bryozoans, uh, there are a number of small oysters at this site as well, but you can see a pretty thick layer by the end of that six month period. So for the next coating, um, again, the same progression here on a month by month basis, you can see that it varies a bit month by month, which does tell us that the coating is able to slough off some of the biofouling. You know, you can see from maybe January to February, there's a reduction. We weren't able to find any statistical relationship between flow velocity and um, fouling percentage on a month by month basis, uh, but we're gonna continue to look at that as this study continues. And then lastly, um, this was the, the coding that performed the best. And we, we really just genericized here the types of codings because we don't wanna be too vendor specific. Um, but you can see the same progression on a month by month basis um, gets us to a spot here in May where we're, we're not too fouled. But up until that point, that coding has performed pretty well. So this is something at a full scale, we might consider um, coding internal manifold piping in a wedge wire screen for those areas that might be either hard to reach for divers or maybe we just don't want to open up that screen, um, just give us, buy us as much time as possible before anyone would need to get in there and clean it. So those were two of the, 
two of the studies that sort of popped up um, during conduct of the Wedgewire screen overall pilot study. And I think that's all I wanted to cover for today. Looks like I've left us plenty of time for questions. And I recognize there are a couple already in the Q&A. So uh, Warren, should I leave it to you to moderate those questions? Great, uh, Tim, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through the, through the questions. Uh, they've been rolling in since you, you've been presenting. And so keep them coming and, and we do have uh, plenty of time for questions. So let's get started. Uh, the first, bar, first four, Tim, are all for you. The first one is from Steve uh, Friedman. Hi, Steve. Uh, and I'll read it to you. Why do you think there was biofouling within passive, but not the uh, rotating screen? Uh, he, his question then goes on, the internal diffuser, which isn't cleaned, would collect bio, bio growth. How about piping to each screen? Was there any noticeable bio growth in the piping? So there's like a, a half a dozen questions rolled in there. Yeah, so let, let me see if I can address them sort of working backwards. So Steve, thanks for the question. Um, Regarding piping, you know, the design of the skid was such that there wasn't a whole lot of piping in it, and that was intentional. We didn't want to create a pilot project that turned into an O&M challenge for us just to keep it running. Uh, but what I can say is those large pump boxes to which the screens um, were attached did become essentially identically fouled over the 12-month period. Uh, it was nothing that would increase differential pressure through the whole system because it's such a large flow area. But we did see a progression from relatively soft algae to more larger blue mussels. So that was the piping question. Um, and then the second question was about, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one? I think it was about the internals of each of the wedge wire screen. Right. Um uh, he thought that the internal diffuser, which isn't cleaned, would collect biogrowth. Yes, the internal. So there, there are a couple of internal pipes inside of the passive screen. One is delivering the compressed air. And as long as that's exercised on a relatively frequent basis, it's going to be hard for anything to live within that air distribution piping. Um, it's as you saw in the video, it's a pretty rigorous, violent air scour um, that's actually preceded by a, a uh, water scour as, as the water is being displaced through that air pipe. So, you know, there wasn't really a concern there. The internal flow distribution piping, um, which is also referred to as the flow modifier which is designed to evenly distribute flow across the full screening surface to make sure we don't have a hot spot where there is more flow getting through and higher velocity. That did become a concern. You know, a part of that is an artifact, at least at the pilot scale, of um, using a pilot scale screen where the open flow spaces are relatively small because the screen itself is small. So that's something we learned in the process of, of a study like this that you know, we would certainly probably see better performance in a larger screen that has larger flow areas. So that's relative to the passive screen. And just to be complete on the active screen, you know, there were much larger flow passages inside when it comes to the flow distribution piping. Um, you know, this was essentially a pipe within the screen, a vertical pipe, which was very large diameter, and had very large perforations in it. So again, it's accomplishing the task of distributing flow across the full screening surface, so you have no hot spots. but it had very large open areas that we think would represent what would be built at full scale. It didn't really have a scaling effect. So when we popped that screen open, there was relatively little um, bio growth. You know, this, not to say we didn't see a muscle here or there, but nothing that would be of concern for precluding flow through that screen itself. Great, thank you, Tim. This next one is for you as well, it's from Gordon Thrupp. Thank you, Gordon. So the video of the air burst seemed to show an, an initial preferential downward flow of air. And uh, Gordon wanted to know what was the arrangement of ports for the air burst and might jets of water, so the second part of his question is, might jets of water be more effective than the air burst? 
Yeah, so there, there are a number of different ways to go about this. I think what's turned into the commercial solution for this passive screen is air, but we have to keep in mind too that the distance from the air compressor and receiver to the screen is about 900 feet. So after an air event has happened, that line, 900 feet of it, fills with water again, you know, up to the surface of the lagoon. So by the time you're air bursting for the next event, about 900 feet of water in that pipe, it's a two inch pipe, at least at this scale, has to be displaced. So what's actually, you know, we refer to it as an air burst, but what's actually happening is there's a water, water backwash first, and that's followed by an air scour. So it sort of performs two functions. Um, and then again, working backwards to the beginning of the question, the, the injection of air through that manifold is intentionally directed downward just because bubbles rise and as much air as possible is injected downward to try to lift everything off the bottom of the screen if it were preferentially distributed either upwards or radially around that manifold, it would probably lead to poor scour of the bottom side of the screen unless you're injecting downward. Great, thank you, Tim, and thank you for that question. Uh, we've got two questions from Steve, but I, we'll, we'll, Steve, we'll circle back to those questions. I wanna get uh, some other uh, uh, participants. Uh, we've got a question from John Munoz, and this is about uh, super duplex. Are you planning on using super duplex for all the piping uh, for this project? And if so, is there an estimated amount of piping footages? Uh, and this would be in an effort to prepare the welders and uh, he just wanted, was looking for approximate numbers of uh, piping. It's a great question. Um, that's probably a better question for a design engineer to answer. And, and I'll say that it's, it's probably likely to just be the screening surfaces themselves. Um, other areas where costs could be cut, I imagine they'd be looking at different pipe material, or excuse me, different materials. And I can say in the slide where I, I gave you sort of an overview of what an installation might look like at full scale in the lagoon, the four lateral pipelines bringing flow from the screens to shore would all be HDPE, or that was the plan. Perfect. All right, thank you. I'm gonna. Um... We have a question here from Chris Rep. Hi, Chris. Uh, this is about, again, uh, the super duplex versus copper nickel. Is copper nickel a California regulatory issue? And what is the problem with copper nickel? So, yes, um, this is not a, an explicit called out piece of any regulation, um, but we had proposed the use of copper nickel um, at more than one project and heard from State Water Resources Control Board staff that they had a concern about the potential for leaching of copper into the environment. Um, you know, in an actively operating intake system, any dissolved copper would end up in the feed water and would be removed in the pretreatment process. But there was a concern stated about um, during down periods where the intake system may be off for maintenance. And what happens to copper during those periods if it's being dissolved and it would end up in the intake area. So to address some of those questions, we, we did a pretty rigorous analysis of the effluent limitations and whether copper nickel would violate any of those during the periods where the screens were not operating. And it didn't seem like a likely, um, a likely outcome that we would violate any effluent limitations. Rather, I think the state of California has, has shown a preference for getting rid of as much copper as possible. And that's driven through the, the marine vessel industry that all use cop, used to use copper paints for preventing biofouling um, on their vessels. And you do see some copper dissolution in harbors where you can have exceedances of limits. So this was more, I think, of a, um, a policy decision than necessarily an empirical one. Great, thank, thank you, Tim. Uh, I think this next question is for you. Um, we've got two from uh, Mahith Nadella. I hope I, I pronounced your name properly. We'll take the second one first. Were there any effect on aquatic life from the airburst? It 
truthfully was not a part of the study um, to look at impacts, physical impacts um, of airburst. But we did have, uh, have a subcontractor out there doing acoustic monitoring during airburst events, both with pumps running, without pumps running, for us to get a handle on whether there is any acoustic signature to operating any of this equipment, whether it's the airburst system um, or the rotation of the active screen. And those data indicate that there were, there were no acoustic levels that would be of concern for marine mammal, um, marine mammal issues. But as to uh, physical impacts, it wasn't part of the study. Great. Uh, thank you, Tim. I'm going to skip down to a question from John Kennedy. Hi, John. Uh, why was the half second foot per second flow rate, the half foot per second flow rate used? Um, th that was specifically tied to the ocean plan amendment language. Um, if a surface water intake is to be used for a seawater desalination plant, it must meet two design criteria. One is it has to use one millimeter slot width. And the second is it has to be designed to never exceed a half foot per second. Um, specifically that half foot per second velocity came from Clean Water Act Section 316B regulations that, that were litigated since the early 70s. Um, and the EPA reviewed a number of studies that had been conducted mostly on the East Coast to try to identify based on fish swim speeds and the types or I should say sizes and species of organisms that are likely to be impinged, impinged that at about a half foot per second, you're giving the majority of organisms um, plenty of hydraulic cue to avoid impingement. Above that, there may be a concern that organisms could be impinged on screens, but that's sort of the derivation historically. And, and Tim, this, uh, this other question from, from Steve uh, also is about that half foot per second. His question was, was there any noticeable head loss from biogrowth on the passive screen? And uh, mm -hmm. his question relates, would the biogrowth affect the intake velocity, which would violate that half foot per second a limit that you just mentioned. All right, I, I seem to have a penchant for going backwards to the question. So let me do the same here. Okay. So uh, in order to address any potential biofouling on any screening surface, it's always wise from an engineering perspective to give yourself some cushion. So generally speaking, when an intake's designed to not exceed half foot per second, we're usually giving it about a 15% cushion in terms of surface areas. So that means we're really designing for about 0.425 feet per second. And then that additional 15% could be fouled and we still won't violate half foot per second. So that would be the approach for the full scale intake to comply with that velocity criterion. And we applied the same design to this demonstration scale as well. Uh, we, never, we never really saw a head loss that could be associated with just the screen surface, because truthfully at a half foot per second, there are no technologies available to measure that differential. It's such a low velocity. So what we had to do was measure the change in pressure between the ambient at the, um, the ambient pressure at the depths that the screens were located with flow through the whole pilot project structure. So essentially any losses in the system that would be associated with the screen mesh, flow turning to go through flow modifiers, through the pump box, out the pump, and then um, through the discharge tube. So any, any, so the answer to the question is yes, we were able to measure differential pressure, but it was, it was through the whole system. And of that whole system, I think roughly two to 5% based on calculations from vendors could be attributed to what's actually at the screen surface for differential. So the answer is it's extremely difficult to measure empirically half foot per second through any screening surface. Interesting, I, I, I did not know that. Okay, so we got two more questions. I think we can get to them, but only if you give lightning fast uh, answers, Tim. So I'm gonna ask the question, but I, want a light, I want a lightning fast answer from you. Um, so you mentioned, this is also from Steve, you mentioned checking turbidity after cleaning. What were the results? 30-second uh, answer. Uh, the results were the system was not designed adequately for us to measure. There was too much of a lag 
in the sample that would have to make it 900 feet through the sample tubing at a very low velocity. So we weren't able to make a correlation there. Okay, anecdotally, sorry, anecdotally, there were, there were no effects of air bursting or brushing on turbidity. Great, thank you. And, and, and the last question that we got from the audience, and by the way, thank you for, for this engagement. We really appreciate it. Uh, were any other manufacturers or products considered? And uh, I, I don't know if they're talking about the screens or the, the coupons, but um, uh, th that is a good question. We not sure how you want to answer that one. Yeah, so we're, we've been real careful about not trying to give any commercial advantage to any one vendor. Um, it, this was a long study in the planning stages, and this is my 30 second answer. I still got 20 seconds. We, we reached out we reached out to all, all all screen vendors of passive and active wedge wire screens um, and the products that made it into the study were those that engaged perfect thank you uh, and Nathan you got off easy I, I was expecting a couple of uh, hardball questions your way but they didn't come that's all the questions we have time for today again thank you uh, for uh, for participating and, and with those questions I want to thank uh, Nathan and Tim for that outstanding presentation that was terrific. Um, I also want to thank, thank San Diego, including Jeremy Crutchfield, for shepherding this uh, and, and uh, their Poseidon partners for shepherding this study through COVID. It wasn't easy. There were a lot of challenges and they did a, a, a fantastic job. Metropolitan was just a co-funder. And um, so in addition to uh, Tim and Nathan, I want to thank Michelle Peters from Poseidon, who apparently was also instrumental in keeping this project rolling uh, through those, those dark days. So I also want to recognize and thank the Metropolitan FSA team who, who's been uh, engaged, uh, Dom Bentley, Matt Hacker, Ariba Saeed, uh, Stephanie Franco, uh, Tracy Abundes, and Nadia Harja Donata helped on with the early, uh, the early phases of, of the FSA program. And today we got a lot of help from Teresa Gonzalez, uh, Nicole Delgado, Delgado from our external affairs uh, department and external affairs, sorry. And then Terrence Lee, Ryan Roman, and Lauren Carrillo from our IT department. Uh, without the hard work and, and help from, from these folks, the FSA program and this webinar just would not have been uh, possible. So uh, the results from this webinar uh, and the final report and the presentation will be posted on our website. And um, I think we'll try to, oh, and Stephanie just posted it in the chat room there. So. Uh, the, they're not up there yet, but we'll post them uh, hopefully later on this week. But uh, we have uh, recordings from prior webinars, final reports, and slide decks from our other webinars earlier this year and, and from last year are also posted up there. Uh, the next, we, we have two more scheduled for this year. They're, they're not scheduled yet, but uh, they'll both be on stormwater. And so look for that announcement. And I want to thank everyone here today who, who tuned in and, and stayed in through the end and, and listened and participated. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, th this study is important. It is going to uh, help other agencies that are considering seawater desalination uh, to, to help diversify their supplies. Uh, we need it. Um, you know, this study might not help help us get out of this mega drought, but it certainly will help us uh, later on as we as we go down the road. And I see one more question. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, well, that's it for today. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Take care.